All right, I want to invite you to grab your Bibles. Um, the topic of this scope, obviously, at this time is... The topic of this scope, obviously, at this time is... R.I.P. R.I.P. to love. And you're going to understand what I'm talking about in a minute. But, um... The subject that we're going to be looking at right now... Um, Technically speaking, conceptually speaking, it's very simplistic. Um, yet, in its practical application, it has eternal, it's eternally imperative for us to understand this. So, although what we're going to look at, technically speaking, conceptually speaking, is very simple, its practical application is of eternal significance. And so with that in mind, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to the book of Revelation, and we're going to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we're given the prophecy concerning the seven churches. And all of these seven churches, ladies and gentlemen, really symbolize seven different phases, so to say of God's people, his church. But we're looking at Revelation chapter two right now concerning the first church, the church of Ephesus. And I'm going to start right from verse one. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Verse 6, But this thou hast, but this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So you can see the church of Ephesus, Christ, the faithful witness, he has several good things to say about them, several accolades, so to say, that he showers on the heads of those individuals that make up the church of Ephesus, rather. I said Nicolaitans, I've said and misspoke the church of Ephesus. He has many good things to say about the church of Ephesus, except for verse 4. The Bible says they left their first love. And he said if they didn't repent of that, he was going to remove their candlestick out of its place. You know, what is the first love experience, everybody? What is the first love experience? I mean, what does the first love experience look like? I mean, in reality, in practical application, what does the first love experience look like? Listen, all I want to do with you right now is look at a few instances in the Bible where we can see exemplified the first love experience so that we can understand what experience it is that many of God's people have lost which he says as a result of that, he has something against them. Okay? Are you ready? Let's go. Run with me in your scriptures. Open your Bibles up with me. We're going to John chapter 9. Now, without me reading all of John chapter 9, in John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man that was blind from his birth. Now, just imagine you're blind. From the time you came out of your mother's womb, you never saw anything at all, ever blind from birth and then one day Jesus comes to this man and he heals him of his blindness <laughs> he heals this man of his blindness so now he actually has the ability to see something he was never able to do from the time that he was born he's a grown man now and for the first time he's seeing as a grown man now, I want you to see how his parents respond to this situation. And then I'm going to begin at verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him 
that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom ye said was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Verse 23. Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Listen closely to me, ladies and gentlemen, please. Listen closely to me. When Jesus impacts an individual's life to such a great extent that Jesus coming into contact with that individual liberates them or heals them from something that has been crippling them pretty much all of their lives, be it physical, be it spiritual. When Jesus impacts a person's life, when he liberates them, heals them, sets them free from something that was debilitating them for all of their lives, ladies and gentlemen. That, that impact that Christ has upon that individual's life brings about within that person's heart that first love experience. And when you look at this man that was blind from his from, blind from the day that he was born, all the all up, all up until he was an older man, when you look at how it impacted his life, it emboldened him with such a zeal for the truth that it did not make a difference whether his parents stood with him or those who were supposed to be in positions of authority mocked him and ridiculed him. He spoke the truth listen closely he spoke the truth even when those who are supposed to be family and friends who should stand beside him even when they didn't stand beside him he still spoke the truth and he spoke it boldly and he didn't even take into consideration that the people that he was speaking boldly to were in some supposed position of authority or Influence because all he knew was that God had liberated him and transformed him, and he would not be gagged from speaking the truth, even if his own family wouldn't stand with him. When is the last time that you boldly declared the truth without fear? When's the last time that you didn't even take into consideration, well, if I say this or if I hold to this truth, then maybe my family members might ostracize me. Maybe my family members might look at me weird. I won't be accepted. Maybe my father or my mother, they might cut me off if I declare the truth that I have come to know as having transforming power for my own personal life. When's the last time that you said, I'm going to stand up and tell the truth and it makes no difference what anybody says and if nobody stands with me, even if family and friends depart from me, I will declare the truth. When's the last time that you did that? I mean, in all honesty, when was the last time that you did that? How many of us are fearful of boldly speaking the truth because we we're scared that people in the church might look at us funny. That's right. 
The pastor might ostracize me or they might even put me out of the church or my father or my mother might put me out of the house. They might disown me or when was the last time you said, I don't care because all I know is that God has been good to me and I'm going to declare the truth because the truth has set me free. The truth has made me free. Let me tell you something. If you're fearful of boldly declaring the truth, even if it means the loss of father, mother, husband, wife, sister, brother, friend, being ostracized by church family, co-worker, neighbor, if you will not declare the truth boldly, ladies and gentlemen, you've lost your first love experience. You have lost your first love. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have someone against thee. You've lost your first love. Let's look at another experience. Just walk with me in this. I just want you to look at a couple of points because the points I want to share with you this evening are points that I want you to personally take with you from this periscope before God in prayer. Because God will have something against us if we don't possess that first love. I want you to go with me now in your Bibles. Open your Bibles quickly. Just looking at a couple of points. I told you, very simple, but very important in their practical application. Go with me to the book of Mark now. We're looking at the book of Mark. The book of Mark chapter 5. Many of you may be familiar with the instance in the Bible that speaks of a demoniac. The demoniac that was possessed with a legion of demons. The demoniac was possessed with a legion of demons. The Bible says, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him. He prayed to Jesus that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, go to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. When this man that was possessed with a legion of demons came into contact with Christ. And by the way, for years, people were trying to restrain this man with chains and fetters. The man was running around cutting himself with stones. It was a mess. The man was filled with a legion of demons. But when he came into contact with Jesus and Jesus casted those demons out of him and then he appeared clothed and in his right mind, as the scripture says, it initiated this first love experience for this man with the Lord. And that first love experience led this man to pray Jesus. He, when it says he prayed, he literally begged Jesus that he could be with him. When's the last time that you begged Jesus? Lord, everywhere you go, whatever I do today, I want you with me. When's the last time you had that deep-seated feeling, I don't want to do anything today without Jesus? Every word I speak, every thought I think, everywhere I go, I must be with Jesus. And that desire to be with Jesus was so great that when you woke up in the morning, you prayed and literally begged the Lord, please keep me. Stay with me, Lord. Abide in me and cause me to abide in you. I need you every moment. Ladies and gentlemen, when was the last time that you felt as though you could not live apart from Christ? Because the first love experience, you feel as though you can't do anything without Jesus. Everything you do, everywhere you go, you want Jesus with you. When's the last time you had that experience? When's the last time you felt like that? Brothers and sisters, if you don't feel like that every day, if I don't feel like that every day, that I have to be with Jesus, that you have 
to be with Jesus. You can't do anything apart from Jesus. You've lost your first love experience. I want you to think about this, but just see the spiritual application. When Eve wandered from the side of Adam, and when she knew that Adam was no longer by her side, and she didn't run back to Adam, she left that first love experience. And what happened? As soon as she lost that first love experience, when she realized she had wandered from the side of her husband, her lover, guess what happened? She fell into sin. Because guess what? The devil was still going to try to come and tempt Adam and Eve. But if Eve didn't lose that first love experience, when the devil sought to tempt her, she would have been by the side of her lover and she would have never fallen into temptation. You see what happens when we don't have that first love experience. We have to have this over mastering desire to continually be with Jesus. Because if we don't, the only result will be our fall. Okay, let's look at another one. Go with me now to the book of John. We're looking at John chapter 4. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You've lost your first love. Repent. Return to the first works. Our candlestick be removed out of its place. John chapter 4 beginning at verse 1 tells us the instance where Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. I'm going to begin at verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Why? Because Jesus said, I've got living water. Jesus told her, I got living water. She said, Lord, she said, give me that water so that I don't thirst anymore, so that I don't have to come to this well anymore. Give me that living water. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Here this woman was. She's going to the well to get water. Why? Because she had a need. She had a real temporal need. She was thirsty. She needed water. But when she came in contact with Jesus, when she came in contact with Jesus and he revealed to her her dark hidden secrets that she wanted no one to really know about, <coughs> he revealed to her that he understood her condition and he also revealed to her that he was capable of remedying her condition. And by faith, she accepted that Jesus could transform her and make her into a new creature. She had her first love experience. And that first love experience, ladies and gentlemen, it excited her so greatly that she left her water pot to go tell other people about how they could get the living water. Listen. She forgot about her temporal needs because she was so spiritually blessed, she realized other people are in need of this same spiritual blessing that I've received and I'm willing. 
she completely sacrificed her own temporal needs to take care of the spiritual needs of her fellow man. Question, when's the last time that you were willing to sacrifice your temporal needs so that others could be furnished with their spiritual needs? When's the last time that you were willing not just to sacrifice a pleasure or an extra in life? When was the last time that you sacrificed something that was needful to you so that somebody might be a recipient of eternal life? So that somebody might be able to truly partake of life in Jesus Christ. You know, many of us, we're downright selfish. Downright selfish. We're not even willing to sacrifice luxuries so that others can experience the joy of salvation, let alone sacrifice our own true temporal needs that are necessary for our existence so that another person might be able to step out of death into eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, do you still possess your first love? Do you still have this zeal for God that makes you a bold witness for Him to make you declare His truth no matter if family or friend or church member will stand by you? Do you still have that love for Jesus Christ that makes you want to be with Him every moment of your waking existence? The desire is so strong to be with Jesus that you don't want to do anything apart from Him? Do you still possess that love that will lead you to make sacrifices upon sacrifices upon sacrifices even of your temporal necessities? So that others might come into a knowledge of the truth that they too might be saved. That they too might experience this overwhelming joy that you have because Jesus is now living in your heart. If you don't have that on a consistent daily basis, you have lost your first love. And Jesus says, be zealous and repent. But I want you to hear something. I want you to hear something that Jesus did have to say good about the church of Ephesus. After he said they lost their first love. Please pay close attention. I'm going back to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, Jesus said, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus says, you, for, you lost your first love. And I have something against you for that. However, you do have one thing. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And that's good. Because I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans as well. The Nicolaitans, ladies and gentlemen, to make a very long story short, were people that were making the grace of God license to practice the lusts of the flesh. They were truly making the grace of God out as a license to perform sin. And he says, those that may have lost their first love, they can still hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Listen to me. Many of us, ladies and gentlemen, we still have a very keen mind and a keen eye to see apostasy going on in the church and in the world. We have a keen mind and a keen eye to see the errors and the deceptions that are coming into the church that are leading people astray from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can see the errors and the deceptions in the world that are leading people to partake in iniquity and thereby become and thereby become not only agents of the devil but literally 
ripe for death and destruction. He says, yes, you, you may hate the deeds of the Lycolaitans. Listen to me. You have a keen eye to see the error and the deception and the apostasy. And God says, that's good because I hate those things as well. But guess what? You've lost your first love. Listen to me. It's good that you can perceive the apostasy. It's good that you can perceive the error. And it's good that you have a willingness to expose it. But if you've lost your first love, you're no longer a medium by which the problems that you are keen to perceive can be rectified. <laughs> they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They saw that there were people that were making the grace of God into a license for the performance of sin. But if you lose your first love, you're no longer a medium by which change can take place. And many of us, many of us, many of us, we can talk about all the error that's going on in the church. We can see all the apostasy that's going on in the church. We can see all the evil and the darkness that is permeating the world. But if you don't possess that first love, you will never be an agent of change. And therefore, God says, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Why? Because you're not letting your light shine. You're just calling out darkness. But you're not shining light. You might as well just dwell in the darkness with them then. Have you left your first love? Have you left your first love? Have you lost it? Have you lost it? Do not allow yourself continue in the condition that you may be in right now. Like I told you from the beginning, all of these concepts are very simple, but they are eternally important. Because if we don't possess that love of Jesus Christ, that will drive us to preach the gospel. Let me tell you something. Most of us, even though we know the truth, you want to know why you don't go and knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. You want to know why you don't go and give out tracts to share the gospel with people about Jesus. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. Two reasons. You're ashamed of the gospel. You're ashamed. You're ashamed of what people will say about you. You're ashamed of how people might look at you. You don't want people to despise you. You don't want people to mock you. Let me ask you something. Ladies, listen to me, ladies. If a man told you that he loved you, but he never wanted any of his friends or his family members to see you, do you really think that he loves you? I mean, you've been with this man, not for one year, not for two years, not for three years. You've been with this man five, ten years, and he refuses to take you around his family members and friends. You think he loves you? It's clear that he's ashamed of you. He wants to keep your relationship with him behind doors. Doesn't want to take you out in public. Come on, man. Think about it, brothers. This woman tells you she loves you, but she doesn't want any of her girlfriends to see you. Doesn't want her parents to ever meet you, ever. You are gonna tell me that you're really gonna believe that this woman loves you? Because she doesn't even want you to take her out to dinner. She doesn't want to go to any public place with you. Oh, she might go to the movies with you because at least you're sitting in the dark for a couple hours. So nobody really sees you guys together there. By the way, we don't go to the movies, but you get my point. And that's exactly how we do our relationship with Jesus. 
You know something, ladies and gentlemen? Let me tell you something. In 2015, everybody came out of the closet. Don't you think it's about time that you come out of the closet? We have to be. We have to be exemplifying those principles, those characteristics that we've looked at this evening. If we indeed if we indeed are operating within the realms of that first love experience. This is God's desire for all of his children. So I say to all of you this evening that Jesus says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You've lost your first love. Repent and do the first works. It's time we get back to our first love experience. Ask God to restore within you a love and a zeal for His truth, a love and a zeal for his work, but most importantly, a love and a zeal for him that will drive you to take this everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. As always, this is a forerunner. Whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth.